Welcome everyone to tonight's episode of Axnar Confidential. I am Alec Peters, the creator of Axnar, and I have with me today uh, one of my favorite people that I've met in all this time that uh, I've been doing Axnar, and that is uh, Linda Alexander. And Linda is the uh, author of the definitive biography of Steve Einath, the guy who originally played Garth of Izar in Whom Gods Destroy uh, way back in 1968. And Linda... Great to have you uh, on our show tonight. I'm really excited. Um, it was great meeting you at, at Axicon. Um, it, that was really the high for me. Meeting you and Sally was the highlight of Axicon by far. And uh, I, I want to thank you for coming and thank you for coming tonight. Well, thank you first for inviting me to Axicon. That was a shock to get that message from you, and uh, I was thrilled to be there. I know, I know, you really made Sally's you know, last number of years for, if nothing else. And, uh, she had a great time. So it was well, very, very enjoyable. Well, I, we have not fin. I mean, we've have not released the video we did of our panel, but we are going to, and I'm going to make sure that, you know, uh, we are going to have a little, a uh, premiere party here on YouTube and we are definitely going to in invite you and, and maybe Sally to join us. Cause I think that would be, that would be awesome. So, uh, so the question has to be asked. The easiest question is, why Steve? What about Steve made you want to write a biography of him? Well, this question is always asked of me when I write a biography. And, you know, people will call me crazy and I really don't care um, because I probably am. But uh, when I write a biography, uh, I believe that the people, I don't go to the people, the people come to me. Um, the truth is, as I was looking for a biography to write, my husband and I were watching TV one night and I was scrolling the channels and there was The Outer Limits, um, the two-parter that Steve did, The Inheritors. And I looked at him and I said, I know that man. And of course, I couldn't know that man because I was barely six years old when that came on, but uh, I was hooked. There was, uh, th there was something about him that I just simply had to know more. And from then on, he was my next biography. There was no other way. And, okay, so it, it, it's fascinating that you picked Steve. Tell us about the other people that you've written biographies about. And, and, and what, was, what was it about them? Was there something similar? Was there a simpler way, a similar way you, you came into it? How, how, did, how did you come and write your other biographies? Um, Robert Taylor, the actor from the olden days, um, Jack Kelly, who was in Maverick, along with James Garner, the Maverick brothers, um, Alan Rocky Lane, who of course was the voice of Mr. Ed, but some people, depending on how old they are, don't realize that he was also a very well-known cowboy star in the, uh, 40s and the 50s, um, and, um, those are basically the ones that I have written about, and, and yes, they they kind of come to me. I look for a biography to write, but until they they hook me, um, many of them go out the window. So it's a, it's interesting and eclectic group that you've chosen to to write about, um, because none of them are a name that will just you know you're not writing about Kirk Douglas or Burt Lancaster or Gene Kelly. You're writing about actors who were working actors for the most part, making their, making the living on the big and the small screen. Um, and, and, and I think the thing that's fascinating is certainly as I was going through and, and, and looking for photos of Steve as we're displaying here, I was like, yeah, that's right. You, you forget how prevalent the Western was in fifties and sixties television. And certainly Steve cut it, cut his teeth there. We have a great photo of him with James Arness from Gunsmoke. Yeah, well, you you couldn't turn on the television set in the 60s, the 60s period, but even into the early 70s, you could not turn on the TV late, I mean, in the evenings, virtually any night of the week and not find Steve Einat on TV. Uh, and I think that's why he was so much in my consciousness, because I grew up on TV in the 60s and the early 70s. And so I was watching As TV I, yeah. all the time. And so he was in my head um, like that. And so um, I like to write about the working actor, for lack of a better term. The underdog is, is what I tend to call them, um, because everybody's heard about 
the the other people. But, you know, these are the people we all saw when we all want to know who they were because we did see so much of them, but we haven't heard about them. Um, you know, and Steve Einat just intrigued the you-know-what out of me. So, <laughs> Well, and so it's it's I know what you're talking about because growing up in the 60s as well, I was born in 1960, um, and watching TV, there were actors you just saw all the time, whether it was John Vernon um, mm. or John Colicos or, um, I mean, I you could go on. I mean, there were actors that were always on Mission Impossible or Gunsmoke or Maverick or the high, uh, uh, what was it, the Big Valley or Bonanza. Yeah. I mean, it's amazing to go back to a Bonanza. Just, I, I still love watching that show. And you, the <laughs> guest stars are amazing. It's including like Clint, Steve Einhat. Including <laughs> Steve Einhat. Clint Eastwood, James, uh, Charles Bronson. I mean, guys who went on to become big stars. And I think that's the thing about Steve that you taught me. And that's that if Steve had lived, and we'll get a little bit into his life and then his passing, he would be, I, I, was, t uh, I was explaining this to the guys tonight. I said, if, if Steve Einhat had lived, you would know him like you would know Clint Eastwood. He oh, would yeah. be just like Clint Eastwood. Not only would he have had a great film career and be all over, but he would have become a director and and directed many, many films. So so tell us a little bit about the the early career. I mean, because the, the early career really is what we have of Steve. He passed at 36? He was 37 years old, yeah. And, uh, well, his uh, he... He cut his teeth on early television, and, you know, he was a working actor. He took everything that could come his way, and he uh, grew each time he took a role. I mean, you can look up his I, uh, his IMDb credits, and every little television show that was on there, you know, pretty much Steve Einat was on those TV shows. And um, one by one by one, he... He got better and he got better and he got better and um, he just he just kept on and the man from from basically childhood he didn't have a plan B he intended to become an actor and there was nothing else that he ever planned to do and his parents were farmers in Canada and he would go out into the fields he would do what he was told to do but he'd be on the tractor. Uh, spouting off Shakespeare you know he'd stand in front of the mirror and he'd do plays because this is what he planned to do and he he never he never saw that he was going to do anything else you know, he was a man who figured what he was going to do and then he figured out how he was going to do it and yeah and looking at his IMDB so he, it, it is really an, an amazing uh, career for being so short-lived um, 73 titles so he was in 73 productions. And as you scroll down, um, you know, if I just scroll down, um, they're all, you know, the FBI, Mannix, The Young Lawyers, Bonanza, uh, Gunsmoke, Bracken's World, Mod Squad. Um, I mean, it's just, here comes The Brides, Mission Impossible, um, it, The Name of the Game, Marcus Welby, The Bold Ones, uh, The Virginian, Star Trek, The Outcasts. You know, it takes a thief, Madigan, Ironside. I mean, this is every, it's a who's who of 60s TV. That's exactly what I mean. Like I said, you couldn't turn on television and not, and he was even on TV on any given night, sometimes more than once. And I found letters. Sally, his widow, gave me a package of letters that she received after he passed away of people who just poured in basically crying in their in their letters that Steve Einat was gone. And they had sent letters to, literally, to Ed Asner, uh, in care of Ed Asner, um, to his widow. And um, these women, and they were most, mostly all women, would take their TV guys in the TV guides in the evening, and they'd mark out ahead of time each week where Steve Einat was going to be on television. Because they knew this actor. They didn't know exactly who he was. He didn't have any starring shows. So all they could do was take their TV guide and, and pour over it to see when Steve Einat was going to be on TV. And I have the letters that prove that. So he had a following. 
um, and you said, you know, that he would be like a Clint Eastwood. That's not just a commentary. That's something that I've been told by Ed Asner, um, Gary Clark, um, any number of actors that are now big names have said that exact same thing to me. So, you know, he was very well known and very well respected within the industry itself. Yeah, because you can listen, it's there in any industry. I think if you're in the industry and if you've been in a while, you know, when there's someone special. I, you, yeah. you you just you know it I mean I used to coach professionally and and I, I coach again now and there's some players you look at them and go that's the player that's got it They're, they may not be there now but that player is going to be great and and and, and whatever that 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 may be you'll you'll see you see it so and tell us his relationship to Ed Asner how how did Ed Asner come to know Steve um they they got to know each other on on TV sets. You know, they would work together in in one or two uh, here and there, and uh, you know, as as we do in professional relationships, we get to know somebody that we have something in common with, and and they crossed paths here and there, and then they found out that they had you know things in common, and after a little while, um, Steve was writing his his movie. Do not throw cushions into the ring, and he showed it to Ed, and he asked Ed if Ed would would take the basically the lead part or a co lead part in it. And Ed said he read it and he liked it, and he did. Um, and I I asked Ed, Ed Asner was very funny. He was the first person to agree to do an interview for me. I mean, the man jumped at the chance to talk about Steve Inat. And um, I asked him, I said, well, why did Steve ask you to be in his movie? And he said, I'm just that good. That's all there is to it. <laughs> you know, he, he's, he's a character. Um, so, I mean, he was just, they had a, a good friendship. Um, they would go out to their wives and they would go out to dinner together. They lived near each other. Their kids knew each other. So um, they ended up being, I wouldn't say they were buddy, buddy, buddy friends, but they were good friends. What, as you were writing this, and by the way, I've just got to tell you, you know, I, I mentioned it to you before. Um, I, I've heard, I've heard a, a, many times, as, and I take it as a great, great compliment, even though it's, neither here nor there um people from time to time have said to me oh my god you look like you look like steve Inat, or you look like the guy who played garth of isar uh you know i've heard that from time to time and it's so funny so uh i mean it's the same thing and, and we've got fans if you look over eccleston angel who's one of our regulars says alec even smiles like him <laughs> which is nice to hear um because he's he, you know for me obviously steve is the most important person I've ever saw in Star Trek. He he touched me the way in a way that maybe he he, he touched you. I, when I saw him, I was like, oh my God, there there was something special about him. Uh, uh, and and it wasn't until the end of, of that episode, but at that end of the episode, I just felt his presence and I felt how he he brought such depth to that character, um, and that's what made him important to me. Um, so. What? Uh, how much uh, movie work did Steve do as opposed to TV work? Because obviously there was a ton of TV work. I mean, fifties and sixties are, you know, uh, I was uh, either the silver or the golden age of TV, depending who you talk to. Tell us about his TV work, his theater work, his film work. How did that all mesh? Uh, he obviously started out doing mostly television, um, but then. As he got a stronger foothold in the industry, uh, he was offered a few parts in films, um, which he took because ultimately that's what he was looking to become, would be a very solid film actor. Um, uh, that One film in particular that kind of really started him out in films was The Chase with Marlon Brando. And uh, it wasn't a big part by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but what was really intriguing about it is that uh, Archie, his character, was a really nasty man. 
And um, Archie was supposed to have dialogue in that movie. There was an entire dialogue written for this character. Um, but Steve looked at the character, and he did this all the time. Uh, he looked at the character. He reviewed how Archie would have reacted to different people within the storyline. And he decided that Archie should not speak. And he went to the director and he said, I don't think that there needs to be any dialogue out of Archie. And they agreed to let him play the role without speaking, which, you know, I, how many actors really are going to cut themselves out of dialogue? You know, that's not all that common. Um, but in the long run, it strengthened the character and ultimately strengthened the movie. And he got the opportunity to beat the living daylights out of Marlon Brando. So <laughs> he got a lot of very good press for that movie. And then he went from there to a number of other movies. And he was moving, he, he really was moving into a solid film um, career when ultimately he passed away. I can't hear you. I've oh, lost you. Sorry, I'm going to ask you to move just a little bit to your right. Because you're a little bit there, we go. So we can see see, see all of you. Um, so when, when researching the book, and how long did you work on the book? Let's let's talk about that. I'm a slow doer. Um, I I want to know everything I can possibly know before I put the book together. Uh, this book was a couple of years in the making, um, <clears throat> and in particular, this book I I didn't know how I was going to end it because um, we all know that Steve ultimately did die. I mean, let's put it this way. We, we think Steve died of a heart attack. Um, and that's the story that's been told all these years. Um, but the more I got into it, the more I didn't believe that the story should simply say, Steve Einat went to Cannes, Cannes, France and died of a heart attack, the end. Um, because it wasn't that simple. I found detail after detail after detail, and things were more and more complicated. So I wasn't comfortable in just doing it that simply. So I wouldn't stop writing until I felt I had enough to do it justice. So it took longer than it, it would have otherwise. And and who who were your primary sources for the information uh, on, 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 on Steve? Who... who helped you the most? Oh, undoubtedly, um, insofar as intimate detail would be Sally, his widow, uh, Gabby, his daughter, um, Brenda, his niece. Uh, they were all invaluable. Um, but then, of course, I spoke to his friends, Ed Asner, um, uh, Gary, um, why am I having a brain dump? Um, he a number of his friends who were in the industry. Um, I just sent out letters to people that he acted with, and most of them got back to me and said, "Yes, I'd love to talk to you about Steve Inat." And uh, that's the way I always operate. I contact people. Gary Clark, thank okay. you, who was on the Virginian, and um, th most of them will usually talk to you. And uh, then I do a lot of armchair research, um, going through old uh, newspaper archives and finding information. And I don't just rely on that information. Then I go and research what I find to make sure that it's, it's viable and true. Um, but from there, then I find documentation that I need to find to verify all that. And how did you come to meet Sally? Um, I actually found Gabby, uh, her daughter, first online um, on Facebook. What would we do without Facebook these days? <laughs> and so I sent Gabby a letter, uh, an email, and um, I told her what I wanted to do, who I was. And I asked her if she um, could give my information to her mother. And um, she did, and I, Sally contacted me, and I sent Sally a copy of my Jack Kelly book because I wanted her to see what kind of book I write. I don't believe in writing um, 
uh, I, I like to write an honest biography. I mean, you know, if somebody has skeletons in their closet, I'm not going to lie about it. But I don't like to write garbage about people. I don't want to write uh, negatives about them just to sell books. So I wanted Sally to see what kind of a book I wrote. And after she got the book and read it, she recontacted me immediately and said, yes, please write this book. So we've become very close friends. What were, give me, say, three things that surprised you the most when writing this, that you discovered about Steve when writing this book? Um, well, uh, his depth of determination to just literally crawl inside his character um, and become whoever it was he was acting, you know, you could... You could see that when you watched him on screen, but but he was 150% whoever his character was. And uh, the way he he would look into a character and then give it his own little flair, um, the way he played Garth, uh, Sally told me that, you know, he just, he decided that Garth needed to be totally over the top. And... The, the term she said he used was fey, F-E-Y. Um, and that he, that's, he, read the, he read the script and he said this man was fey. And so he was going to play him that way. And he just knew that that's who Garth was. So he had to become that person before he could act that person. And um, uh, he just was, he was so passionate about absolutely everything he did um, and everybody he knew. So, um, you know, I, I'd say, and then once again, you know, not to, to go over it too many times, but um, the one thing that really, really shocked me the most was, was the end of his life, you know, finding out that it, it wasn't as simple as everybody thought all these 40 some odd years later. So tell us and tell us about tell us about what he was doing and how that how how he came to pass. Well, he went to and I always say this wrong, so anybody out there who's listening forgive me if I mess this up, but he went to Cannes, France um, to promote the movie that he had written, directed and starred in, Do Not Throw Cushions Into the Ring. Um, it's an odd title, but it does make sense when you know what the movie's about. Um, and he had put 35000 some odd dollars into the movie of his own money. And even here, there's a, there's a correlation between you and him. And um, he uh, <clears throat> went there and he was carting, you know, back then they had movies in those big movie tins. And he had a movie tin. He was carting all over town, and he was making deals. Um, there is there is record that he was talking to people, and if they were handshake deals and such. Um, and not long before he was to leave to go to, he was supposed to be going to Berlin and then coming home. But before he was to leave France, um, Every he and Sally would have these phone calls, and back in the day, I even remember doing this. You could call long distance. You'd have to call through an operator, and you'd call long distance and say, um, uh, "Have the operator call and ask is is Linda there?" And then on the other end, they'd say, "No, Linda's not home right now." And then you'd call back, so you knew that the person was there, and you could call, and it it wouldn't cost as much. So Sally and Steve would do this. And so they called and they asked for their dog, whose name was Bootsy. <laughs> and they, they had one of these phone calls arranged, and Steve called her, and the operator asked for Bootsy Inat. And then before Sally could get on the line, Steve disconnected the phone call, which she knew he would never do. Um, and the long and the short of it is that ultimately the phone call to get reconnected, it took hours. And when she got back on the phone, um, they hung up on her. Uh, the, there were so many complications involved in that. Ultimately, X number of hours later, she got through to the, the line in France. 
and somebody got on the line, supposedly a doctor, and just cursorily told her, I'm sorry, ma'am, but your husband's dead. Um, and he was in a hotel room by himself. Uh, no one was in that room with him. And they found him dead in the shower. Uh, and a doctor supposedly had seen him prior to that, uh, given him a pill, said he thought he might be having a heart attack, but he left him alone in the room and said, if you're not feeling better later, I'll take you to the hospital. Um, but then he turns around and certifies him as, as having had a heart attack. They did no autops autopsy. They did nothing. Um, and, and I'm going over this really fast, but there are so many little idiosyncratic details that, that at the very, very least, Steve Inet died of very bad medical attention. Um, and that's, that's the very least of it. Um, you know, there are so many other options that, that could be there. Steve's movie ended up being shown on television in the 80s when there was no deal in ever the, made. In the 80s? So in the 80s. No deal was ever made for this movie. Sally never received royalties. To her knowledge, she never signed anything saying that this movie was allowed to be shown. She has no idea how the movie ever was put on television. And has it ever resurfaced? Has she ever been able to find the movie? Uh, well, she has a copy. The family has a copy. But how did that copy that ended up putting it on television because I found the listings of it on television. How did that get to anybody to put it? So there was another copy somewhere. Somebody put it, somebody gave permission and somebody made money off of putting it on TV. Nobody knows who. Hmm. So right there, there's another unusual little mystery involved. So, you know, there, and like I said, that's just, that's just skimming the details. Um, tell us about, uh, tell us about Steve and Sally. Um, they really were like one of those fairy tale love stories. Um, you know, they, Sally was, truthfully, Sally was a play girl, a playboy model. She was um, a centerfold. And she was strikingly beautiful. She's still a very attractive woman. Um, but back in the day, she was strikingly beautiful. And they met at a, um, an after party at a play. And she was trying to get away from a guy who was hitting on her. And Steve walked up to her and literally said, I think I love you. <laughs> he had no clue who she was. He'd never seen her before. And she looked at him and said something to the effect of, yes, that's what you should say to me. And um, they ended up together from there on out. And um, they were, and he was a very good, he was a good family man. He took her daughter from a previous marriage and, and became her father. Oh. To this day, she adores her daddy, Steve. So it tells us some little bit about Steve as a person. Oh, definitely. He was a very good family man, a father, a husband, very solid. Um, so first, let's do a little commercial for your book. Where do they where where um, where do you want people to to buy your book? Uh, Amazon? Uh, Amazon directly from probably, probably the easiest is on Amazon. It's Amazon. So here it is, everyone. Linda Alexander, The Life and Death of Rising Star Steve, Steve Inak, Gone Too Soon. Um, so if you want a copy, uh, you can go to Amazon and get it in, in paper act. And um, I will, Linda and I have been talking about doing a special uh, a special edition for Axnar fans because um, I really would love to do something, uh, you know, special. Um, I, just the story, because not everyone who's on here knows it, Linda, but um, your book <laughs> came out. Like what? Two weeks before Axicon? I mean, oh no, it had been out. It had been out a while before. This. Okay, I think you you happen. I to just happened to note. Yeah, I guess that's yeah. someone posted this photo that's on here um, of the book cover on on Facebook, and I was like, oh, that's got to be a joke. <laughs> 
And, and, you know, because people make up like TV guide covers of, of Star Trek fan films and all. So I'm like, I'm like, who, who would write a biography of Steve Einat? I mean, I was like, hopefully I was like, this can't be real. Cause if it is, it would just be too good to be true. And so I went to Amazon and I'm like, Oh my God, it really is a book. And, uh, I think I found you on Facebook. I th- yes, you did. You sent me a friend request. And that's why I said I was shocked because I had heard of you before and I had thought of contacting you, but somebody told me, Oh no, he's too busy. Oh. <laughs> and so I didn't. <laughs> So, folks, it, it was so fortuitous because it was like a week before Axicon. And so I'm all excited about this book. And and I reach out to Linda. And Linda lives like two hours away from me in Alabama, two hours away from Atlanta uh, in Alabama. And I was like, oh, you've got to come <laughs> to Axicon and be a guest. And I guess you, Linda, were the one who said, "Who? well, what about if we invite Sally down, right? Yeah, I asked if you minded if I checked with Sally. And I was like, She's mind? <laughs> <laughs> this, this deal keeps getting better. So, uh, <laughs> so yeah, so it was, it, it, it's just amazing sometimes how lightning strikes. So Linda and Sally came down and uh, we did a panel and, and Linda you know, talked about some of the same things she's been talking about now. And I really hope you all will go out and buy um, a copy or two of, of the biography. At least. At, le- at least two. <laughs> I've got two. I guess I'm going to need some more. Um, and, uh, and if you want, uh, and if you want it personalized by Linda, I'm sure she'll, she'll do that for you. We'll, we'll, we'll figure out a way to get that done. Um, oh, someone's post. I think people are posting. Uh, Answering a few questions. Yeah, some some questions here. So, um, so yeah, so it was really amazing. I I was so excited you two came down. Um, we had a wonderful, wonderful panel, and um, it it was it was really awesome because, um, you know, I, Prelude to Axar is in many ways a, a a memorial to Steve and a homage to Steve. It's certainly inspired by by Steve, um. And to get to, sh- you know, share that with Sally and with you is, you know, really fantastic for, uh, f- for us. I mean, it, it just it adds a whole nother layer to what we're doing. And um, now that we're in pre-production on the next two episodes and when we do shoot them here in Atlanta, I ho- I'm hoping you're going to come up uh, and, and see it. Because, Plus two. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'll bring Sally down, too, because uh, that would just be too awesome. Um, so let's see what we got. Uh, um, I, I just posted a link. If anybody would like a signed copy, I have a, I have a, a site that that they can send through there, and I can sign it that way. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, is the book available on Kindle? Yes, it's available on Kindle. There you go. Um, uh uh, so Hunter is asking, uh, didn't Mr. I not do Westerns, Lin- Linda? Yes. And I did answer that. He did many Westerns as everyone in Hollywood did in those days. <laughs> yeah. Um, did Steve, I not want to play Star Trek again, be in Star Trek again. That's an interesting question. I'm sure that, that was never. A question. I don't know that it was ever asked of him. I do know that he, there was a quote from him about, um, uh, Star Trek and uh, about uh, his buddy in the show thinking that, you know, it was, he wasn't sure that Star Trek was going to last. Um, little did he know. Uh, but um, he felt that it was kind of, you know, it, it was one of those shows that it just may or may not last. If it did, it would be great. If it didn't, then, you know, it was kind of a shot in the pan. But, um, uh, I'm just reading, and you're way ahead of me. You're answering all the questions right there in chat, Linda. So thank you. Uh, th- thank you so much. Um, if anyone else has has a question for Linda, please, please ask away. Um, n- now that you've done his biography and you look back, is there anything that maybe you found out later or um, you wish you had 
emphasize more in the book or is there something that you maybe missed that you found out later? Tell, is there anything about the book that you would do differently? Um, I don't think there's anything I'd do differently. Um, I, I feel as if I did him justice. Um, I, uh, I, I feel comfortable with, um, with what came out. Um, <clears throat> especially since after Sally read the book, Sally was just very happy with what, with what was there. Um, especially since she told, she told me that I told her many things she did not know. Yeah. You, um, I remember you said that to me. And, um, if I can, and, and I was told that by Jack Kelly's wife, if I can be told that, then I'm a happy camper. Um, so, um, and, you know, I, I the only thing that I would like to do, and I think if I can, if something else comes out, I would, I would write more about um, the mystery of Steve's life and the end of his life, because I think that that's a story that still needs to be told. There's a lot more that's, I've recently found that the doctor is still alive in France. Really? I mean, he was alive when I was writing the end of the book and, um, He's put out two different stories about about the end of Steve's life. He's told me one story. He told Sally a different story when when Sally died. I mean, when Steve died, um, and I thought that he might be gone by now because he's basically Steve's age. But in the last two weeks, I've learned that he is still alive. So um, you know, I just he never he would not respond to me. Um, I gave him ample opportunity to clear that up before I published the book, and nobody ever did. Um, so I'm, I just think that there are too many loose ends, and if I could have, if I could have cleared them up before I ended the book, I would have done so. But I'd still be sitting here without a book published. So, and. You would love. You think this is worthy of a Hollywood screenplay, don't you? I most definitely do. Um, if there's anybody out there who wants to help me write it, get hold of me. <laughs> it's it's kind of like a uh, what was his name, George Reeves, sort of. Hollywood. Yeah, was it George Reeves. Mm -hmm. he played um, Superman. Yeah, yeah, sort of thing. Because it's not like Steve was extraordinarily well known, but he was known by so many within the industry, and it's one of those things that you don't know exactly what happened. It may not have been what you think, or it may have been more than what you think. But in today's world, we have so many mysteries that are out there that are, we're, we're filling our TV sets and our movies with mysteries. You know, his story is a good mystery. Well, um, I can say for myself, you know, it's, it's so interesting finding out about Steve and then going back and seeing things that he's been in, you know, because I've only ever known him from Star Trek. I, I, I'm sure I've seen him in something else, but never recognized that it was him for whatever reason. Um, you know, because I was too young, because it was before Star Trek, whatever the, the reason may be. So it's so interesting to see, and especially now you go and see his IMDb and you, oh, I've got to search out that episode or I've got to find the bonanza where he's in it or whatever the case. Um, and you realize really what a fantastic actor he was, which, which is really wonderful. Um, well, I, I just want, you know, I, I want to thank you for coming. I'm going to encourage all of our fans to get Linda's book. Um, uh, we are going to continue to talk about doing something special with it uh, because I think it's just, it's, it's awesome, and I'm hoping that uh, uh, Linda. I'm hoping you and Sally will both come down when we shoot Axonar and and uh, and see the production. I think that would be amazing, and everyone would get a kick out of it. Um, because I know the people who were there who met you all were just totally blown away, and it was it was really it was wow. really it was awesome. I appreciate that. Yeah, and, uh, there there is the possibility that you may have you may involve Steve's nephew. Is that not yes? Correct? Yes, you gave me uh, Steve pronounce his last name Mackay Mackay Steve Mackay who's an actor up in Vancouver right he's in he's, he's Vancouver, in Vancouver yes. yeah and um because he was in Stargate and I uh, was funny I looked him up on IMDb and I go I remember him in Stargate so this is Gar this is Steve Inat's nephew yes he's uh, a very talented Canadian yeah actor. 
Yeah, he's very, very good. So, um, yes, I'm going to follow up with him, and we're going to see. Uh, it would be a lot of fun to get him in in Axanar. Uh, maybe the we'll be shooting a couple of days in L.A., and that's going to be a lot easier for him to come down to. Um, but I will uh, uh, definitely follow up. Well, listen, um, we're going to uh, uh, say goodbye to Linda, and thank you, Linda, so much. We're going to thank everyone once again for tuning into Axanar Confidential. Um, we're going to um, uh, stay tuned, everyone, uh, for tomorrow or Wednesday. We're going to do another episode of Axanar Confidential, uh, I think, just to uh, because tonight we're going to uh, end this uh, episode right with Linda. And uh, Linda will probably stay on and answer some of your questions. So please ask Linda questions. Um, she loves talking about the subject and she obviously is the expert here. So um, thank you all to all of our regular, all of our regular viewers. You're all there. Uh, thank you so much. Um, Adega Outlaw, thank you for your super chat. We greatly appreciate that. Don't be late next time. Uh, <laughs> um, and oh, and uh, before I... It, it is not a YouTube uh, event unless Michael Weir donates. And uh, Michael Weir just gave us $50. Hi, Alex. Just want to say I received the signed blueprints and blueprint in the Aries. They look awesome. Thank you. Uh, Linda Michael is one of our big donors, and he donated when we saved some um, puppies recently from Texas because we do dog rescue. And Michael was one of uh, was instrumental in that. Um, so uh, thank you, Michael, once again. Uh, greatly, greatly appreciate it. Everyone, please go and buy Steve's biography on Amazon. I want, I want Linda to see a big uptick in her sales today. Um, and, uh, and read the book. And then, um, you know, we'll, uh, 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 we'll have a, a time where we'll all talk about the book again and what we particularly liked about it. And uh, then we'll... Uh, uh, we'll definitely have Linda back uh, another time to talk some more. And uh, that's it. So th Linda, as always, you have enriched my life and in, in, uh, my Axonar life especially. It's been a pleasure uh, having you. I, it was so fortuitous to meet you and to have you and Sally come down to Axicon. And we will continue to uh, uh, collaborate, shall we say. Maybe on I other things. <laughs> thank you so much. I appreciate it. No, thank you. Thank you, Linda. It was great. And everyone, as always, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, we greatly appreciate it. We hope you found this educational and interesting and learned something about the original Garth of Isar. Um, so um, until, uh, until next time, I want to say everyone live long and prosper and uh, peace and long life. Linda, thank you so much. We'll see you again. Thanks. Bye-bye. Okay, Linda. Great. That was awesome. And it's going to be up on our, our YouTube channel. So uh, you, if you have, you know, want to link it to anyone or, or post it on Facebook or something, like that, you can easily do that. So yeah, that, that's great. But uh, all right, I'm going to stop it. And hopefully.